We're glad to be sharing the ministry of Redemption Church with you. Now join us as we receive the Word of God. Is God good today? You bet He is good today. Everybody, welcome to Redemption Church in Plano, Texas. Can you hear me okay? Am I on everything good? Tech team, give me a thumbs up. All right, we got a thumbs up. Good. I have no idea sometimes. They have to tell me. I don't know these things. But I do know you are in Plano, Texas at Redemption Church. And my name is Chris Fluitt. Greetings to everybody watching, listening online. Greetings to everybody in the room. We love you all. And God is with all of us and wants to work in all of our lives tonight. You believe that? I am blessed to be in a new year, and I'm honored to share the Word of God with you today. How's your new year going so far? Just little thumbs up, thumbs up, sideways thumbs, is okay? It's like, it's, it snowed today? How about that? That was some pretty awesome snow. I'm like, yeah. I mean, those were nice flakes, right? That was some wild stuff. Gosh. Um, I hope it's still a happy new year. Is it still a happy new year for you? Anybody? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe it's been a rough week, right? Absolutely. We're in the second week of our series called 2021, all right? And last week we preached on unity, and you know, sometimes your pastor nails it, right? I nailed it last week because did you see the week that we just had? Our world needs unity more than ever. We need unity in our churches, unity in our homes, unity in ourselves, unity in our families, unity is in our marriage, unity in Washington, if that's possible. But we need it, don't we? Absolutely. If you missed last week, you go to our website, go check that out, go find it on the internet somewhere, YouTube. It's, it's there for you. Redemption Plano is our uh, website. Go check that out. We, we, Told you last week, what's the most important number in the Bible? One. The number one. It's the most important number in your Bible. Your Bible declares there is one God. Yeah. There is one mediator, Jesus Christ. And that Jesus Christ is also the one saving sacrifice. And that the name of Jesus is the one name above every name. It's the only name that saves. And in your Bible, this Jesus prayed that you and I, that we would be one, just as he and the Father are one. So in the beginning days of 2021, we're going to purpose in our hearts, in our minds, in our strength, and in our souls to answer the prayer of Jesus and become one. I mentioned that last week. What if Jesus had a prayer you could answer. Well, this is it. Jesus has a prayer that we'd be one, and you and I play a pretty big part in that prayer. So let's answer Jesus' prayer for a change. How about that? Anybody glad he's answering your prayer? Yeah. Oh, and man, does he. So let's answer his prayer. Let's be one. He only prayed that about 2,000 years ago. Let's get on it. Let's do it. Jesus' prayers, prayers, Praise a prayer that we can take part in answering. Jesus prays that we would do more than just call ourselves Christians. Jesus prays that we would do more than just attend some church. Jesus prays that we would do more than just put up with each other. Jesus prays that we would do more than just show up once a week, shake hands, sing a few songs, hear a message, and then go home. Jesus prays that we would be one in complete unity. And I don't think we're there, church. I'm not saying that we like have all-out civil war amongst ourselves. Not that I know of, right? But to have that complete unity where there is no unrest, where there is nothing but love, We need to have that complete unity in this church body and across the world. We need to have that. Jesus prays that we would be one in complete unity. Jesus prays that we would have the same unity as he and the Father have. That is no short order. That's big stuff. Let's do it. That If he prays for it, that means it could happen. So let's have it. In order for us to achieve this, 
we must be willing to do more. Would you agree with that? We must be willing for the Spirit to work more than ever in the past. Surrender to the Spirit. We will need more of God, more of His Word, more of His will, and we're going to need less of something else, less of us. Less of self calling all the shots, less of pride, less of ego, less of culture wars and canceling each other in our culture and all that stuff. We need less of that. Today, I want to talk about being one in the home. Somebody said one One. in the home. home. Today, that's what I'm going to talk about. Have you ever noticed that people can be one way on the job, in the school, in the classroom, online? at church, at the grocery store, but be completely another way at home. You ever notice that? I feel like you don't really know a person until you experience them in their home. Like eating with them, but even more than that, being in their home, a meal in their home. If you can have a meal with someone in their home, I feel like now you really know that person. That's my way of saying, invite me for dinner at your home. I'm I'm waiting. (laughs) It's almost like the real person is the one you would find in their home environment. Everything else, you know, I don't know if you are really getting the real person. There may be a little more authenticity in the home than in society, than in the mask we wear outside, than the suit we put on to walk out the doors of our house. It leads me to ask of myself, who am I really? Who am I really? Am I one way at home and another way when outside my home address? Who am I really? That might be what other people are asking. Maybe our spouses are asking that. Our children, our close friends, they might ask after viewing us in different environments. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I've got a picture up here of my three kids. I'm blessed with these three kids. These kids are an absolute blessing. I don't deserve these sweethearts. They're my three kids. We got Will, we got Hudson, we got Josh, and they mean the world to me. I would do anything for these guys. I'm not a violent guy, but I'd get violent for these guys, right? I love these guys. These guys bring me such joy Moments like seeing Josh catch a brand new Pokemon. You have not lived until you've seen Josh catch a Pokemon on Pokemon Go. My goodness, lights up like a light bulb. Seeing Hudson and and, and Will ride their bikes for the first time, and they're wild about riding those bikes. They just, they want to go up and down that block, just watching them. It's so much fun. Yet, these guys are also able to hurt me like nobody else. Seeing them hurt physically or struggling in a problem. My oldest son, Will, he struggles with autism and seeing how it affects his ability to make friends and to interact with other people. It hurts me. It hurts me sometimes. Seeing them fall on their bike hurts me sometimes. These kids I love, I would do anything to help them. You could take down that picture for a moment. Church, I hope we feel that way about all the kids here at Redemption Church. Not just the fluent kids, but all the kids in our church and all the kids in our neighborhood and all the kids in our city. The new stories of kids you'll never meet. You ought to hold those deep in your heart. They ought to lead you to prayer. They ought to lead you to hurt when they're hurting and to be joyful when you're seeing them joyful. Would you be willing to do something to help those three kids up there if you saw that they were in need? Let's put that picture right back up there. Those three kids up there, would you would you do something for these three kids if they were in need? What if they weren't these two kids? What if, what if there were three nondescript kids you didn't know who they were? I want to tell you, there is a disturbing statistic as we're looking at this picture. 
that two out of three children raised in church will end up walking away from church, walking away from their faith in Jesus Christ as they enter adulthood. We're talking right after high school, they're entering college in that block of time. They say adios to the things of God. You never see them darken the doors of a church Again, if I told you that two of my three kids were missing, would you help me search for them? Would you help me a little bit? Or would you like gas up your car and tell me where to look, pastor? I'm going to go look. If I told you that statistically your child, your grandchild only has a 33% probability of being a follower and a worshiper of Jesus, would you go and do something about it. You can take down that picture. When we gather on Sunday, at one point in the message, or not the message, but the service, right after worship, we bring out a big green leaf and we celebrate our kids excitedly hurrying off to Sunday school where they're going to learn wonderful stories about the Bible, wonderful stories about hope and love and forgiveness and Jesus Christ. We celebrate this every Sunday. Wouldn't it be alarming if after the service, only one third of the children who entered the classroom remained? Would that freak you out? It should freak you out. Wouldn't news of an abduction of children spur you to action? I hope to spur you to action today. If you have children currently, plan to have them in the future, or you're simply an empty nester today. If you're an empty nester, woohoo, you've made it. I don't know how you've done it. But whether you're any of those today, I, I pray that your heart is stirred. If you plan to never have children, that happens. I'm praying that your heart would also be moved to help families take on the responsibility of retaining these precious gifts of God called children and to claim them for the kingdom of God. I'm talking about being one in the home today. Somebody say it, one in the home. What do you think two out of three? Why do you think? Two out of three children depart from the faith. I just want you to think that in your head. You don't have to say it out loud, but just think it. What is that about? What's, what's going on there? Pretty alarming stats. These are the stats. Now, what do they mean? I want you to think about what they mean. You might be able to come up with other reasons for a two-thirds exodus, but I feel like the Lord has directed me today to talk about the subject of authenticity. Everyone said authenticity. We need authentic lives in and out of the home. Would you say amen if that's true? Many people that walk away from faith have similar stories. Stop me if you've heard this one. I just got tired of all the hypocrites. My family went to church and at church they acted really excited, but at home they were completely different. My dad shouted amen to the preacher. But at home, he shouted at us and he shouted curse words and he shouted abuse at my mother. My parents, my mom and dad took us to church every Sunday and told us to respect the house of the Lord. And after service, we'd get into that car and my parents talked about how much they disagreed with the church. And my parents seemed to disrespect the house of the Lord in the car. At some point, I just didn't need all the negativity of church people. I was hurt by those who said they loved me. What they said and how they lived just didn't match up. Anybody hear any of those before? Anybody Anybody heard all of those before? Anybody? In my, yeah, yeah. I do not think two-thirds are walking away from Jesus because they found Jesus to be lacking. Jesus is not the reason why somebody is walking away from the church. It's the, it's the church. It's the church or it's what's going in someone's life or it's a little bit of 
both. I think it's often a little bit of both. I think, it, and my, my job today, I'm not beating down the church. You, you don't even think I'm not even going to start into that. I do think that two thirds of people are walking away because they find the people of Jesus to be lacking. The people of God represent God and affect how people feel about God. Whether you like it or not, you are on God's marketing campaign. Yeah, you are a big advertisement, a big billboard. That's you. Paul says that your life becomes an epistle. Everyone said epistle. epistle. What does epistle mean? Somebody shout it out. It means letter. It's also a book of the Bible in our context. The more, more than half of the New Testament are letters. They are books of the Bible. Your, Paul says that your life is an additional book of the Bible that people see your life and it's like them reading the Bible. Wow. Second Corinthians three, two, two and three is where he says that you yourselves are our letters written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. You should know, you know, you show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. You listen to me, your life matters. Your life matters. It's a lying voice that says your life doesn't matter. Christian, you listen to me. Any voice that says you don't matter, you are unimportant, you knock that down, that is a lie. Your life matters. The authenticity of your life attributes authenticity to the word of God. I'm going to say it one more time. The authenticity of your life attributes authenticity to the word of God. Well, that's big stuff. Matthew chapter 5, verse 16 says this. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Your deeds affect how others will glorify God. You are that advertisement. 2 Corinthians 5 and 20. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. What does it say? It says you are Christ's ambassadors. And it says that God makes his appeal through you and through me. Who you are matters. Your life matters, but who you are in that life, it matters. You ever see a bad advertisement? I showed my wife an advertisement today. I just, she couldn't even believe it was real. Have you ever seen one of those? It's like, who made this? And did they think this was going to make us buy this product? Have you ever seen that? Like, I really wish in, a, in an alternate universe where I make all the bad decisions, I would show you that video. This is not that universe. <laughs> My wife's very, my wife wouldn't let me. All right. Are we that bad advertisement? Is our church that bad advertisement? My goodness. You are Christ's ambassadors and God actually makes his appeal through us. Not only, it's his choice. It's his plan to reach. Through. Sometimes I have to go, God, this was maybe not the best idea. This was God's plan to reach out through you. You know what? why he does that? It means that none of us can just stand on the sideline and watch God do the work. No, our lives actually have to be real. They have to be authentic. They have to be changed by moment by moment as we love people and allow God to reach out through us into their lives. Do you see that? You want that? Oh, I need that. I want that, Lord. Who you are is eternally significant. No man is an island. Your life will always interact with others and affect the lives of others. Nowhere is this truer 
than in the home. Who you are in the home preaches the loudest sermon. Who you are in the home is the loudest declaration of what you believe in and who you believe in. The biggest epistle is who you are while in the home. The place where your deeds shine the brightest and people either will or won't glorify God, that place is in the home. Your station as an ambassador for Christ, it must include your home. The world doesn't just need another person to profess Christianity. Ooh, and I'm going to get in trouble here. I'm going to go ahead and do it. Because that's what most of our services are built on, getting one more person to profess. And once they're out of the way, they profess, they're like, good, all right. We'll never see them again. Next. I, I got to tell you, that is not Christianity. That is not the Bible. That is not the plan. The world doesn't need just one more person to go, yeah, I believe that. Not what they need. This world is in desperate need of authentic Christ followers. People of integrity. People of integrity. You know what? Inte integrity is one of my favorite words because people are always weird about how they view integrity. Integrity, I always think of like when you're building a structure, you're building a building. Let's say you're building a skyscraper. They have to test the integrity of that building or it's got to be torn down. And they test that integrity because it's got to ha be the exact same building whether it's a beautiful sunny day with a cool breeze and whether there is a earthquake yes. or a tornado or some combination of both, a sharknado perhaps. But it's called integrity when regardless of what's hitting it, it stays the same. We need to be Christians of integrity. That it doesn't matter what is being thrown at us. It doesn't matter what the latest headline in the paper is. It doesn't matter what our stock portfolio is doing. It doesn't matter what our children think about us, what the world thinks about us, what the people on Facebook think about us. No, we are the same always. We're Christ followers. We're people of integrity. We're the same person in our house that we are outside of our house consistently living the truth of God. Moms and dads, what am I telling you? You live Christ everywhere you go because eyes are watching you. You are writing an epistle that is being read. Workers in the church, friends, extended family, live Christ at all times, because ears are listening to you and they are weighing your words carefully against your beliefs to see if they match up. Members in the church, I want to tell you there is no area of your life that is unimportant. Who you are in the grocery store, on the interstate, on the social media, it all matters. Somebody say one divided. When we are not consistently the same person everywhere, when we are hypocrites, when we are less than 100% authentic, we become one divided. Some verses I'm going to throw at you very quickly. James 1, 8 says a double-minded man is unstable in all their ways. James continues, verse 22, with a command to be more than a hearer of the word, but somebody help me, a doer. doer of the word. And then James 4, 8 says, draw near to God to wash your hands, to purify your hearts. He says, you double-minded. Jesus told us, Matthew 6, 24, that no one can serve two masters. You will either end up devoted to one and hating the other. Are we trying to serve more than one master. Are we one divided? And the Lord says in Mark chapter 325, he says a house that is divided against itself cannot stand. We need to be authentic. 
we need to be real. We need to be one. The one and same person who shows up in every place and every location. We need to be one in the home. I graduated high school in 1998. Since that time, I have run into uh, colleagues I went to school with, right? I went to high school with these people, and you'll, you'll just run into them everywhere. And you can, om- I've, I've, maybe probably the Lord helped me understand this, but I can see relief in their eyes when they say, oh, you haven't changed a bit. I used to think they meant that about how you look. No, it's about your heart is the same. Thank goodness you, you are this good Christian guy and you're still that person. That you have still integrity. That you're still loving. That you're still peaceful. And when they see that, some of them may be far from God. When they see that, they experience hope. Hope. It is hopeful to see people walk out a life in Christ. We need to be those people, but it has to be, has to be, has to be within our home. Last week, we talked briefly on the Shema. Everyone said Shema. Shema. This is the first command of the Ten Commandments. It is linked to the commandment to love, uh, to, uh, to seek no other gods before me, right? That's the short way of saying it. In Deuteronomy, the word Deuteronomy means the second law. It's the second telling of the law. And so Moses tells it in a more thorough and longer way. And that is what we're going to read today. The first of the Ten Commandments has everything to do with living out authenticity in our home. Remember the word Shema means hear. Hear as in to listen. Deuteronomy 6.4, that is the first word of that verse. Here, as a pastor, as a preacher, and a person who loves the word of God, I desire that you would know the Shema. The Hebrew word means here, and when Jesus was asked, when he was asked, what is the most important commandment? He quoted the Shema. We're going to look at that Mark chapter 12, verse 29. The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart and with all your understanding and with all your strength and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. To love the one God and to love your neighbor is more important than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. This should remind you of a verse we read last week. Well, let's look at it again. Matthew 5, 23 through 24. Jesus says, Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift, your offering, your sacrifice there in front of the altar. Then go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. How we treat God and each other is more important than bringing our gift, our sacrificial offering to the altar. Can I tell you today, how you treat God and how you treat others is more important than how you clapped your hands today, how you sang today, how you will pray in this altar today, how you amen the preacher. That was good, but it's more important that you love God and that you love your neighbor. And it, all those other things, they are meaningful, 
but they're only meaningful when they're real and they're authentic and they flow out of a heart that loves God and loves the neighbor. Do you see that? Thank you, Jesus, for this truth. We believe it. Lord, help us to live it. So Jesus spoke of the Shema. Say Shema one more time. We're going to turn in our Bibles to the very scripture our Savior is quoting. It's found in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. This is such an important verse to a Hebrew. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. So here in the New Testament, Jesus teaches on the Shema that we just read in the Old Testament. His audience, the Jews, had a deeper understanding than likely any of us have of what Jesus is talking about. They could have quoted everything we just read in Deuteronomy 6 and a lot more. Like quoted it, not struggled, boom, comes right out. They held this command high in their hearts, high in their lives, and in their traditions. Let's really try to understand the command for a second. We're going to look at it together. There is, number one, one Lord. One Lord God. There's only one. If you get this one wrong, it doesn't matter what else happens. You've missed it all if you don't understand who the true one creator of the world is. There's one God. Don't be looking for multiple gods. Don't be looking for several. There is one Lord God. Number two, this one Lord deserves all of you. The one Lord deserves all of you. Because he's one Lord, you you don't divide your attentions and your heart and your love to others beyond him. That's why you don't worship the Lord God and worship this other God over here. Would it make you nervous if I name some of those gods? Like the Lord God, Jehovah, and also Netflix. See, y'all, y'all were surprised by that, being it? One Lord God and dollar bills. See, if we're not careful, we will have more than one God. Because some of our love doesn't go to him, it goes over here and it goes over here. There's one Lord and this one Lord, he deserves all of us, all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our strength, all of our soul. And we are to love this Lord God. This is the first place in the Bible where it actually tells you to love God. You're supposed to love this God. You're supposed to love him. No compartmentalization. You know what that means? That means, sure, I love God openly at church, not at school. I love God openly when I'm with my mom, but not when I'm at the water cooler at work. No compartmentalization. He gets it all. That's what all means. Not partitioned, all. God gets all of you. Your all goes to the one Regardless of the location, regardless of the situation, he gets it all. And when he gets all of you, you become one with the one God. Number three, I want to tell you this commands, the commands, this is more than one command altogether, really. The commands of this one Lord, the Shema says these commands should be present. It says the words, they should be upon your heart. See that should be on your hearts. Did anyone go to the grocery store today and forget their heart at home? No, right? Your heart goes everywhere with you. Guess what? The commands of the Lord, the love you have for God should go everywhere with you. 
Is the word of God present in your heart? Is the word of God present in your actions? You know that the Bible tells us very clearly that what is in the heart comes out. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Guard your heart because everything flows out of it. This is what the word of God says. And I think we feel pretty good saying it's in our hearts. If we can get real for a second. As Christians, we like that little phrase. It's a little phrase we like. Well, you know, it's it's in my heart. How about this one? We've invited Jesus in our heart. He's in our heart. He's in our heart. Okay, good. We are proud to say we've hidden his word in our heart, right? But do we allow what is in our hearts to flow out? You see, it's in the flowing out. You really know that it's in your heart. It's in your mouth. Jesus says, some of you draw near to me with your lips, but your heart is, somebody help me, far from me. These are the words of Jesus. So it's got to be in your heart. It can't just stop there. It's got to be in your children. My fourth point here is impress them upon your children. That means you got to bring them home. They don't just stay at the synagogue for a Jew or a Christian at the church building. No, you bring them home. You impress them upon your children. Have you ever impressed anything on a child? (laughs) I have. You need to impress some things on your children when it comes to God. And not with the same anger that you probably would use for, I told you five times to clean your room. Okay? It says, talk about them when you sit at home. What do we usually do when we sit at home? Go back to that Netflix example, right? It would be really good We've tried doing this. We're working really hard at it to turn off entertainment, to make entertainment wait, actually, is a better way. Last night, we we watched a a family movie together. But before we watched David Bowie's Labyrinth, we said, we're going to sit down and we're going to read the Bible together. And then we read the Bible. And then we asked, what did you learn? Who did Jesus heal? What did Jesus say? What did he ask Peter? Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home. It also says when you walk on the road. We don't just walk on the road a lot, but we drive on the road a lot. When we're in that car, why don't we sometimes have a conversation about God with our family, with our friends in the car? I've always found (laughs) you've got a captive audience. (laughs) You're on 75. You're going 70. So what do you think about the Bible? Do you have any questions? I mean, like, where are they going to (laughs) go? It's it's a fun thing. But no, I've found that my kids want to talk about the Bible. They want to talk about things that matter. They want to understand it. They want to understand why we worship at home, at at, at church. They want to understand why the world is so messed up. When you walk along the road, when you're driving in your car, talk about it. When you lie down and you get up, that means morning and night. Not just a part of your day. No, it's like first thing, it's last thing, and it's sprinkled all through the middle. And the last thing I'll talk about is this. It says to tie as a symbol upon your body. To tie the word of God all around you. It said specifically to tie it on your hand, to tie it on your forehead. They would actually build little devices and it would represent the Shema and they would wear it on their hand. Anybody use your hand today? Yeah. Every time they would use their hand, it would remind them there's one Lord and he deserves all of me. And when they would Look in the mirror. They would see that on their forehead and it would remind them, you don't belong to yourself. You belong to the Lord and he deserves all of me. And when they would have face-to-face interactions with other people, they would see that person belongs to the Lord. That person belongs to the Lord. I'm supposed to belong to the Lord too. 
The hands represent actions. All of your actions should be tied to there's one God. He deserves it all. And the forehead, what do you think that represents? It represents your thoughts. Your thoughts should center on the one Lord and that he's deserving of it all. Here's the last thing. On the door frames and on the gates, it was written Shema. It was written that there is one Lord. And that he deserves. They, they put it there to remind them. The door frame, that's your immediate home. That's where you live. In order to go in and to go out, you have to be reminded there's one Lord. He gave me this home. Thank God for it. He deserves every bit of glory within it. And as I go out into the world, he deserves it. That's your immediate home. Needs to be a marker that there's one Lord and he is worthy of it all. And then the gates, where you have your door, gates are a little further out, right? You would put a gate on the furthest extent of your property. That's where you'd put a gate. Well, that's like the furthest extent of your influence. It ought to be impossible to interact with you and for someone to get the impression that you're not a Christian. When they come into your sphere of influence, they should see a gate that says, there's one Lord, I belong to him, and he, I love him with everything. And our interactions with people ought to declare that. I'm not saying that that's your opening. Someone says, hi, how are you today? And like, there's one Lord, I love him with everything. How are you? I'm not telling you to do that, but I'm telling you the choices you make, the patience you show with people, the kindness you have, the generosity that you have, the, the willingness to help and the willingness and the, the, the instantaneous ability to love. That should be the gate of your life and everybody sees it and knows it. You know what you can't do with all of this? You can't fake it. You can't. If it were one little part of your life, you could fake that. If you love God completely, there's no room for fakery. If you continually bring God and his word into your life, it leaves no, no room for fraud. So is your Lord one? Do you love him with all? Is he in every part of your life? Are you one inside your home? No matter who lives in your home, are you one there? Moms and dads, husbands, wives, will you build a home centered on your unity in Christ? There are some people who aren't able to build such a home. Do you understand this? There are people that walk through the doors of our church that aren't able to build such a united home. We minister to some people who come from a home that is disunified. We minister to children from broken homes. We have ministered to children that their parents, oh my goodness, were so far from the Lord. That their parents were centered in drugs. That their parents were centered in abuse. But that child, we could have helped them. We could be a help to them. We could unify with them. We also minister to people who live with those who are completely against God within their home. And they should continue to love those people. But inside their home, it's almost like a battlefield. There are some people that aren't able to build such a home like you are. So can you help those people? Can you be a source of unity for them? I want to remind you, two out of three children, remember that statistic? Can you do something about that? Would you be willing? Could you help with our kids' ministry? Could you volunteer just a little time? And I get it. Some people are like, uh, yeah, <laughs> I love kids, but uh, mm. no, <laughs> that would not be a good idea. I get that. This is not a guilt trip on you. Not a guilt trip. 
Could you do this one instead? Could you impact a kid? If you don't feel comfortable being a Sunday school teacher, could could you be a person who truly loves God and loves them and allows them to see it? I remember growing up with some just great Christians in a church who never taught my Sunday school class, but they taught me so much. I remember some people that just, they would drive the school bus, the church bus, and they would go pick up all these children. The Greens, I remember that. They'd pick up those people, and I saw that love in their heart for people. And I was like, wow, they really love those people. I remember little some older gentlemen in the church that would be like, they had this little game at church. She was like, they wanted to teach you to greet people. And so if you'd walk up to them and you'd say, praise the Lord and take out your hand to shake them, you'd get a piece of peppermint in your hand. And that taught me at a young age what I'm doing now. I love people. I'm, I'm so glad you're at church. I'm glad you're here today, Deborah. Isn't that wonderful? Could you be that person? Could you go buy some peppermint? <laughs> I don't know. But could you go find a way to impact? How about this one? Lead a small group, teach a Bible study, help unify with you someone else around the Word of God. Can you do life with someone who really needs a brother or sister in Christ? In our homes, can we unify around one another? Who you are matters. Could you close your eyes for a second? You listen to me. Who you are matters. So, who are you really? Get that answer. Come on, who are you really? I want to see you. Sarah and I have been watching a very godly show that has a lot of murder in it. (laughs) It's a show about foreign spies living in America. And it gets really ugly because the spies are set on harming the United States in every way. They're living in America And they act on the cover like they're just everyday normal citizens. They look, you know, like apple pie and rock and roll. You know, they're just normal Americans. But on the inside, they're actually trying to destroy the United States. But what I find so interesting about it, the show is that these fake Americans, they accidentally start to love America because of the freedom. And they actually... I believe, get won over because of the freedom that is all around us that we sometimes take for granted. Are you, if you will, if you feel like a fraud, you're not alone, I promise you. But if you will continue to seek God, He will win you over. He'll win you over with His freedom. With his love. I remember a time in my life where I felt like a double agent. I was, I was, uh, in high school. I remember I would be one way at church and I'd be a different way in school. I felt like a double agent. Um, I want to tell you, you're not alone if you feel like you are fraud sometimes. I remember going through those phases. The life I was at home and at church, they were so different. And it was a miserable existence. I didn't enjoy it. I was a fraud and I would tell you that I was unhappy. I was myself a house divided. But even though I was a fraud, the love of Jesus won me over. And it changed my life. I remember the day I decided I was going to have one life for God. And that was one of the happiest days of my life. It was like a burden was lifted off of me, deciding to follow Jesus and live for him. This could be your day. This could be that day I'm speaking of for you. That could be your day. Today, the more at one I become with Jesus, the happier I am. I become happier and happier the more fulfilled I become. The more I clean out the secret sin, the happier I am. 
the more I surrender all, all of my fear and anxiety, the happier I am. The more I forgive others, the more I really love God and love my neighbor, the happier I am. The more fulfilled I become. Before the Lord can be one in your home, you need to be one in Him. Are you one in Him? Are you one divided? You believe there's one Lord? Is He getting all of you? These altars are open. For more information about redemption, look us up online at redemption-church.com. We want to hear from you, so be sure to connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, or even our anonymous question text line at 214-856-0550. Thank you for joining us and have a blessed day.